everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce this first international uh, webinar of Secret, uh, organized by, by the Italian Society for Trauma and Emergency Surgery, uh, in collaboration with ESTES, with the European Society for Trauma and Emergency Surgery. Uh, as Secret's president, I am really proud of the initiative we had to launch these educational webinars. We are at the sixth edition in less than two months, and the last one was uh, also organized by our nursing group. The feedback were very positive, uh, not only because we got a significant number of participants uh, in quite all the editions, uh, ranging from 200 to 300 people, but also in terms of content and scientific level. Uh, thank you to this feedback. We have time by time refined the format of our uh, webinars. Uh, this was possible, to be honest, and we have to thank them uh, to the vision of the entire uh, Secret Executive Board and to the commitment of Alan Miloslavo, Diego Mariani, and Dayato Curiara, who made an extraordinary effort in the organization of the webinars. Today is the first international webinar announced outside the Italian borders and we are happy to run this event in collaboration with Estes. As a founder member of Estes in 2007 uh, and for many years member of the executive board uh, of Estes, I feel once more proud that the European society is beside secret. At the same time, I'm really happy that the national society, and SICUT is the first one, maybe, uh, institutional member of ESTES, has the opportunity to promote an educational activity for a larger audience. I really hope that today, the today event could be the primer for an active engagement of the national societies in ESTES. So uh, let me introduce now the, the guests and explain you the schedule of you the schedule. schedule. Sorry, the schedules of this meeting. Uh, Tina Garde from uh, trauma, the Trauma Center at the Ulevel University in Oslo will present a case scenario. Five finalists will discuss the case with Tina. Jonathan Fiesel from Hull, UK. Falco Idrick from the Trauma Center in Utrecht, Netherlands. Pep Dalving, Chief of Surgery in Tallinn, Estonia. Jacopo Pallavicini, emergency surgeon in, surgeon in Turin, Italy. Uh, Andrea Mingoli, uh, I do not see him now, but uh, I think he will join. Um, Chief of Acute Care Surgery in Rome. Uh, and Marius Kiel, that is a, is a well-known trauma surgeon in Zurich, Switzerland. And at the end of the panelist discussion, he will give a lecture on priorities in major trauma with spinal lesion. For all the attendees, uh, know that question and answer will be answered during the discussion uh, with the panelists. And for those questions will not be answered directly from them. You will have the possibility to uh, discuss and to have answer at the very end of the meeting after uh, the lecture of uh, uh, Dr. Kiel. Um, I think that uh, uh, I would like now to shortly explain uh, to the, all the loyal and new participants some trick for an effective participa participation. I ask Ayato Curiara to uh, share the, um, the slide of rules in order to understand how to use this simple and very uh, intuitive uh, uh, tool. Okay, perfect. Uh, so as you, as you can read, uh, do not use the chat uh, button on the, on the bottom of the, of the screen. Uh, it's only for technical communication, so don't use it. Your uh, attention should go to the question and answer button. Uh, it's in the right place. Uh, uh, to, to write, uh, you can write them your question and uh, uh, to, you can ask directly to one panelist or you can open the question, your question to all panelists and we will uh, try to summarize at the end of the meeting in order to, to, 
to, to give you the, the right to, to got uh, uh, answer from them. Uh, panelists can, are allowed to, to, to reply directly uh, to the question and answers um, button to single to, to attendees. Please mute your mic when you join the, the webinar. This is not an issue for attendees, but is, a, is an issue for panelists. Otherwise, you, we, could, we, could, we, we could have some uh, noises and, and we can disturb the, the fluency. Uh, if you want to raise your hand, you can raise your hand. Go to the participants button. And then on the right side, in the bottom, you, you can find the button. Uh, 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 a written uh, rise hand you can click it and you, you we know that you want to intervene or to 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 to, to have a, a a comment on what uh, is going on uh, so thank you very much i will leave now the the the, the mic to uh, massimo Caluggio, my friend uh, is head of surgery in uh, in pisa and uh, of emergency surgery in Pisa and uh, is the incoming president of Secret. Massimo, go ahead. Thank you, Mauro. Just a few words to say to everybody, welcome. Welcome to this webinar and to explain how, how I feel uh, proud to have uh, such top class uh, guests uh, in the webinar. And uh, I hope this is uh, just one step of a long uh, road that uh, will uh, consent us to share our opinion again in the future. Uh, so thank you to everybody. Um, Ayato, would you like to explain some other things about the webinar? We start with uh, the first presentation. No, I think uh, we, time is running. Uh, we, we want to stop at seven o'clock, maybe a few extra minutes, but uh, we know Mario's Professor Kiel will have to leave at seven o'clock sharp. Yeah. So please, Tina, can you start with a case? There we go. Uh, so good afternoon and uh, I have the honor to present tonight's case. Um, everybody can hear me? Audio sure. is yes. Yep. 40 year old man uh, is now you're on call in your hospital and you get uh, warned by the pre-hospital personnel or the ambulance uh, in, in, in where you work uh, that uh, a, a man is going to be brought to your hospital he has fallen from a height. Um, what they say is that it's more than five meters. We don't know exactly how high it is and we don't know, it wasn't witnessed. What, and I don't know if you're all familiar with the missed handover, but uh, a way of condensing the information necessary for, for uh, uh, the team to, to know what, how to plan their, their assessment and treatment is uh, M for mechanism, I for uh, injuries uh, suspected or, or diagnosed, uh, S for signs and symptoms, and T for treatment. So injuries, they have, uh, they have uh, already diagnosed or, or identified an unstable chest, bilateral ankle fractures, and he has back, he's complaining of back pain. He is coming across as hemodynamically unstable or compromised. He has a DCS of 12 on scene and it's falling during transportation. He's cold. This is a load and go with no treatment given, and it's about 12 minute transportation time from scene to your hospital. So, do we, uh, do you want to, Hayato, do you want to pull up the first? Uh, my, my next, my first question to you is how do you prepare? What kind of patient is this? Is this a worrying patient? Is this a patient you want to have a trauma team for? Okay, so uh, just uh, one more rule. We are going with the poll. You have uh, 10 up to 15 seconds to reply. You can answer. Uh, so do you wait for the patient the trauma bay or do you ask to be called when patient arrives? That's the first question. And the other question is, uh, what is your action while waiting for the patient? That's a multiple choice uh, answer. And uh, if you have a massive transfusion protocol, are you going to activate it or not? Or in your institute, 
you do not have a massive transfusion protocol. So when we will reach at least 65% of people, we will stop uh, we will stop the poll. So 30 people already replied, 22%. And then we will share. You have to be efficient now because if not, you're gonna, not, not going to know the end of the story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So we, during the poll, uh, just a little advice to avoid to waste time, please answer very rapidly. It's all decision, it's all about decision making. So we, we have to take decision during this, this K presentation. So 60% voted, 62, a few more. Okay, uh, I think we can share the results. So we see that few, can you see the results? Yeah, we can see the results. Some people, they just ask to be called when the patient arrives. Most of the people will be in the trauma bay. And uh, regarding the, your action, uh, good answer regarding communication. Few people are checking room temperature. Tina, yeah, you can come. I just want to comment a little bit. Obviously, I mean, the first one, I'm really happy that you're all worried and we all want to be there. Um, uh, that is basis for trauma assessment, to be there as early as possible. Uh, the next one is to communicate to trauma team members injury possibilities. I, I think the, the reason why people choose that, I think that's extremely important to plan for your team. Um, I assume that the temperature of the trauma bay is high already, and that is why people is not choosing that. Um, mm -hmm your temperature in your trauma bay should be as high as it's possible to put the temperature. Um, then I think the last, and then the same thing for the last question. So getting prepared with pelvic binary resuscitation. So be prepared for everything. And I think that's what should be, uh, should be communicated to the team as well, is that this patient is troubled and we need to be, to, to be ready for the, for the worst possible. Nothing is worse than fall from height. Maybe even if it says more than five meter, could be five meter, but that could also be 15. And then this uh, activation of massive transfusion uh, protocol. Uh, really happy that most actually want to do that. I'm, I'm aware that there are different, different routines and protocols. But I think in this kind of patient, you don't want, you, you, you want to be, it's better to be safe than sorry. It's better to have the possibility and have the products there and he is going to, to, to need transfusion, I promise you. Okay. Okay, stop sharing. You can go ahead. So this guy arrives. He has a fair airway. He's a neck collar. Trachea is midline. Uh, air entry equal on his B, and he is saturating 80%. Respiratory rate is 12. He is cold, not clammy. His blood pressure is 99 over 74. He has weak central pulses only, i.e. that means no peripheral pulses palpable. Pupils five and reacting, GCS of three, not yet intubated. He is temperature of 33.5. Um, Logrol was not performed. We can comment on that later on. And he has obvious extremity fractures clinically. So the next question coming up then is what, what will be the strategy? Um, just wanting to say that I can just go, I'll, I'll push it a little bit forward. I think having a very, very uh, a standardized assessment and approach in the team for these patients is important. Uh, in, in our situation, you would get a chest X-ray and a pelvic X-ray for, for all of these patients and a FAST uh, with eFAST uh, and so on in, in that primary survey. You would obviously activate um, massive transfusion protocol in this guy. If you look at his his blood pressure. The temptation of saying that uh, he's not that sick, 100 systolic is not that bad. But then if you look at the pulse pressure, and he's, he's a young guy, and when you actually palpate, so in my mind, both blood pressure is much less important than actually touching the patient. Having only central pulses, 
and no peripheral pulses is really patient is in, in really, really deep trouble. And this is a short, pro oh, probably a short time after this happened. Transportation time is short, it wasn't witnessed, but, but worst case, this is a short time after, after he, he, uh, he fell. And he's cold. So this is his chest x-ray. We're not gonna pull up a poll. Uh, can I call on one of the panelists to tell me whether this patient is dying in his chest at the moment or not? Can I pull on um, uh, Falco? Yeah, so you have a very uh, unstable patient. Main problem now primary is an A problem. You have a threatened airway uh, and the B problem. I'm just asking you, is he dying in his chest? Not now. Not now. Good. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> we just have to be efficient now. Okay. Is it dying in his pelvis, Jonathan? Could be. Okay. Is this, what do you see in the pelvic x-ray? He's, he's got an open book fracture there. He, he should have a pelvic binder put on, but then see where we go from there. Okay. So if he now is sick, physiologically sick, you want to have IV lines in, you want to start resuscitation. Does any one of the panelists want to intubate him now? Right now? Nobody yeah. says anything. Well, his uh, GCS is three. Yeah. I and definitely do want to have a um, airway. Nevertheless, yeah. uh, while intubating him, he will uh, fall in pressure further. He may do that. But certainly he needs a A fixed. Yep. So in, you want to, so I think one of you um, um, was mentioning also pelvic binder. He obviously needs a pelvic binder on. You want to have his, he definitely will have his airway, uh, but you have to be worried about this guy's um, uh, circulation before intubating him because he will deteriorate if you intubate him right now without having resuscitated him first. And he came without an IV line. So he, he will need uh, some access very, very quickly. Pelvic binder helped a little bit. Close the book. Okay, so he was intubated. IV access was very difficult. They struggled with getting IV access. His GCS was three, so he was he was intubated. And guess what happens? I think it was already mentioned by Pet. He goes into cardiac arrest. Now what? Shall we go with the poll now? Yeah, we can do that. What would you guys do? 10 seconds to reply, to answer to the poll. So somebody, I can see the results live. And a lot of people will start CPR. Few people will start with the reborn. Twelve colleagues would perform an emergency room thoracotomy. Uh, laparotomy to people. Uh, Extraperitoneal pelvic packing. Quite a few. Okay. Okay. Are you able to? I'll share the results. Okay. So my question to the panel, I just need some, so, uh, uh, some clarification from the panel. What is wrong with this patient? Does CPR do any good in this patient? No, it does not. What is his problem? He is empty. He is out, out bled. There is exactly. no, no help of CPR. Exactly. So uh, he does not have an IV line. How do we put a reboa in if they can't get an IV line? Anyone in the panel? <laughs> you, you could do a venous cut down or an um, expiration in the groin. Yeah. Can I ask but, that? But you have some other priorities as well. There, there was a question from uh, Shahim Mosheni. Uh, he wrote, we would get a femoral access in this patient for reboa before, before intubation. And he was asking for a comment on that. They, would, they were trying to get IV access, and they're, they're very, very seasoned anesthetists and, and emergency physicians. They could not get an IV access before he, he arrested. So you are there in arrest with no IV access. 
So can anyone of you do a, a cut down and get IV access faster than I can, uh, I can compress his aorta with a thoracotomy? I, I will get an IO. But the, the heart doesn't work. The heart doesn't beat anymore. The IO gives you 50 mils, 50 mils per minute. So this guy is empty. You don't have an IV access. While you're working on getting an IV access. Okay. If we then continue, he got an emergency room thoracotomy. While they were getting an IV access, and they got the IV access in, in, during that time, they got an IV access and could start filling him up. A high, high caliber IV access in the cycladium. Okay. The other thing about femoral lines in a, in a bad pelvic fracture is that it's not very good to have, have a sort of lower, lower IV access. You don't know where that blood is ending up. So he had, a, uh, he had a, a emergency room thoracotomy. He was filled up and he got his heart starting again. Young guy, strong guy, and witness arrest. So now what? They got back his blood pressure, his blood, blood gas. No big surprises. I think we knew that. I mean, any blood gas in this guy would be bad. But it's always nice to have a first blood gas to see where the trend goes when you start resuscitation. So now he has his heart beating and you're in there. His aorta is compressed. Heart starts beating again, filling up. Now what? What kind of uh, resuscitation? Would you go for and now you can put up the next poll i think Kayato. yeah it is so what's your resuscitation strategy uh, regarding the trauma induced coagulopathy correction what is your strategy 15 seconds to reply to this poll 13 people 30 percent almost 30 percent reply Just remember that the poll is completely anonymous. I didn't declare that, so just reply. Okay, we reached almost 70% of uh, answer. I'm sharing the results. Okay, so that means most of you want to give him blood, blood products. One way or the other. I mean, we could have put up a fresh whole blood as well. The point is you wanted a, a balanced transfusion uh, and, and as little crystalloids as possible. And this guy, he has bled out his blood volume. He doesn't need water back. He needs blood products. Obviously, if you're able to, to have it available. And, and again, back to actually activating a massive transfusion protocol before the patient arrives is, uh, is, uh, would be good. Um, Regarding trauma-induced coagulopathy, uh, I think, uh, so goal-directed therapy, yes, that means could be tranexamic acid, could be fibrinogen concentrate, uh, depending on how you, how you monitor, and I'll come back to that. And then fibrinogen concentrate, that depends on where you are also, whether that or cryo would have been another uh, possibility in order to give more concentrated fibrinogen. Because we will we'll have to assume that this guy has a really low fibrinogen. He has a really, really bad, because of bad, bad blunt injury, he has a really low fibrinogen. We know that beforehand. And uh, even a trans balanced transfusion will not replenish his fibrinogen um, uh, storage. Okay, so I just want to, so this guy was then included. It's not to promote a study or anything. This is a, a, an ended study and, and we're about to submit the results. But this, this is a, a study uh, that uh, compares uh, CCTs, or conventional coagulation tests, INR, fibrinogen level, um, and uh, platelet counts and so on to uh, the, the goal-directed or um, VHA, the viscoelastic hemostatic assays in, in, in the form of Rotem or TEG. Uh, this guy was then, in, included in the TEG arm. And we had uh, sort of trauma, trauma developed a specific um, um, treatment therapy, treatment algorithms for, these, uh, for this study. 
where you have specific indications for fibrinogen, for extra platelets, for extra plasma, and extra tranexamic acid based on the results, in addition to one to one to one, plus for, uh, tranexamic acid. So he got tranexamic acid no matter what because of clinical indication. And the CCT arm would have been the same, but with no extra additional indication for tranexamic acid because the CCTs cannot tell you that you have to, to that they don't tell you anything about fibrinolysis, hyperfibrinolysis. So this guy first take trace. Do we have one comment from any of the panelists, a volunteer? Is that a normal trace? And what's your biggest worry? I can comment if nobody else wants to comment. The, 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 the blue line, the, the, the flat line, I don't th know if you see that in my, in my arrow, the, this line is completely flat. And that reflects, this is a normal value of the, of the fibrinogen level. It should be 15 to 32 millimeter high and it's 2.3 millimeter high. So it's completely empty of fibrinogen. So that means there is indication to give him extra fibrinogen in, in, for, in the form of cryo or, or fibrinogen concentrate. Um, the patient is back with a, with a normal pulse. We took an, an, a new x-ray in order to see whether there is an indication to put the chest tube on the, the other side. Does anyone in the panel want to say anything? Yes. Yes, tell me. So his main stem bronch on the right is intubated. So he is uh, losing volume on the left side. He doesn't ventilate anything on the left side. Otherwise, it, uh, he's got a rib fracture uh, left lower, but otherwise it's okay. So he need, the, the tube needs to be pulled. Yep, exactly. So now the tube is pulled. Thank you, Pep. <laughs> Uh, the other thing is that he has, he's obviously been operated. So he has, his chest is open on the left side and that's why it looks like that on the left side. Uh, so the tube is pulled back and the point is in a stressful situation, tubes can uh, be misplaced and, or di displace themselves. Um, now do what? We have, do, do we have concern on the widened mediastinum? And the proximal? Say again? The widened mediastinum on the proximal part? Uh, it looks normal from the open chest. There is nothing, it looks completely normal when you're inside the chest on the left side, he has a big thoracotomy on the left side and it looks completely normal on that side. So no big worry at the moment. I think this is uh, uh, because it's in, with, with the, an open chest basically. Okay, now what? Do you want to take him to CT, to the OR or to the angio lab? I would just say that the, the photo you see is because we do on the, on the mid, in the middle of the photo, this is the trauma bay with three uh, beds. The CT scan is here and the angio, the hybrid operating room is here. So you can do angio and operating in the same. That is not always the case. So if you have to choose, you have to choose one of them unless you have that uh, possibility. Can I ask a question, Tina? Do, sure. do we have a possibility to do eFast? You can do eFast. And do we find free fluid in the abdomen? Again, we, we said with it, the fast was done. There is blood in the abdomen. But would it make a difference? What would be different if you if you if it wasn't if you couldn't see any blood in the abdomen? The patient now has he has about he has, compressed, he has a pulse, a heart that's beating. He's got now five units of plasma and four units of red blood cells. Starting to give fibrinogen. Does it matter whether he has a positive or a negative fast? Yeah, so sort of, because you still can have a problem in the pelvis, which is unaccounted for. It's the question whether you should go to end your uh, laparotomy. Well, I would say that this guy is sick as a dog and, and uh, 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 go to angio. That takes quite a long time to do his, to, to, to do his angiography of the pelvis. You haven't even relieved the, the aorta yet. So we can share the poll. Yeah. The result of the poll is uh, almost half of the attendees, at least of people who replied, would go to OR. Uh, 27 percent who reply will go to CT scan and the rest will go to under suit. So I, I would say that a guy who has an open chest 
and he has a really, really bad blood gas. He just came out of a cardiac arrest. He obviously has a bad pelvic injury. And whether or not he has a positive fast, I don't think he has anything to do in a CT scanner. That is, that is I think, the, the simple answer to this. And then there is the difficult answer is, if you don't have the OR and the, and the angio suite, you still have to make that, that, that um, depending on, on the resources you have in that situation, but knowing that it will take time for the angio to, to, to achieve what you want to achieve. Okay. Shall okay. we go? Yeah. So he goes, he goes to the OR with angio possibilities. Uh, the abdomen is packed for initial control. There is blood in the abdomen. Uh, there is a huge hematoma in the pelvis, mostly on the right side. He does, so there's a systematic laparotomy uh, with splenectomy and packing of, so, so the, the, the pelvis is packed extraperitoneally. And then in the same, um, in the angio suite and the or operating room, uh, hybrid room, the, the pelvis is coiled um, during the same uh, session. And with, uh, there will had to be a, quite a lot of pressure on that, on that side of the pelvis while they were doing the coiling, but then uh, it, 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 it controlled the bleeding better uh, after the coiling was done, but still venous bleeding. So it could be repacked with less pressure extraperitoneally, and then he had the temporary abdominal closure. Do you have a, a small question? How is the pelvis fixed in this moment? There is a pelvic binder on, and the pelvic binder is put on at the level of the trochanters. It's actually a pelvic, it's actually a bed sheet, a, a folded bed sheet, and, it, uh, and at the tro level of the trochanter, it's low enough to get the, the angio done above it in the groin. I think normally we put on these, these binders far too high up. They should be on the level of trochanter, and I think very much, a lot of people don't actually know that the trochanter is lower than we think. So putting the pelvic binder on the right side, they can do that. Uh, they can do the, um, uh, the, the, the angiography above it. So the chest, this guy has now, I'll just show you the, he has now at about 20 units of red blood cells, 20 units of plasma. And, and the anesthetist. And during that time, there is ongoing communication between anesthesia and, and the surgeons. Uh, and uh, he is now normalizing. He's now, his physiology, they can turn down the, 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 the drips and so on. The chest is closed with, um, with the intercostal drain. And then in order to be sure, the intercostal drain was put in on the right side. There was suspicion of, of there being something on the right side as well. His new tag, after those 20 units of red blood cells and plasma and so on and so forth, was better. I think you can see that the fibrinogen level is coming up. Not normal yet, but still coming up. And the, 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 that also pulls with it that the normal, that the, the, the full, the, the, um, uh, the, the maximum amplitude of the, the main tag trace is also normalizing. Okay, so his pH is now 7.07. .07. His lactate is down to 18.4. His hemoglobin is 10. Okay, be worried about also the calcium and follow that because during that kind of massive transfusion, they do need calcium during that. This is his angiography uh, with the pelvis packed. So it's actually packed off uh, the, the, the artery and he's now get a full embolization of his internal iliac on the right side and then repacked with less pressure on, on everything in that, uh, in that area. This is his completely normalized tag trace. He'd also got eight grams of fibrinogen, so he got first four grams, and the next fibrinogen level was still too low, less than two grams uh, level, and then he got four grams more of fibrinogen concentrate. So it's now normalized, and he's, he doesn't need that kind of ongoing transfusions anymore. This is a slow drip. And temperature is coming up because all the transfusions are given on a level one warmer. Just showing you also that uh, I think instead of using uh, very expensive back systems, I think a uh, normal wound vac combined with a, with a homemade internal vac component, much cheaper for everyone, it's doable and it's uh, still, um, easy to maintain uh, pressure and vacuum with using a normal, simple wound uh, sponge. So now, do you want him to CT or ICU? He's still not normal. You saw his blood gas. 
Do you want to pull up the poll? Beato? Sure, I'm coming. Uh, do you want to have a comment from panel? Do you want do you guys want to take him to the cities or to, to uh, I see you now? 10 seconds. I, I, I think he needs a CT scan because his uh, GCS was three. He may have a fatal head injury. Um, um, so he needs a CT scan and he looks pretty okay on the viscoelastogram. Um, but the body temperature is coming up. Um, I think he needs a CT scan. And I think the point, do you want to, are you there Hayato with the end of the poll? Or is, do you have to wait more? Yes, okay, I'm sharing the poll. Does anyone else? Everybody agrees with that. Anyone on the panel don't agree with it? I think the point is that we, we, need, to, we need to know that we can actually uh, warm the, temp the patient and follow the, the patient with the team in the CT scanner as well. So we, don't, we, we can actually continue resuscitation passing by the CT scanner. And I agree with Pep, we need to, have, we need to know more about his other injuries, the ones we don't know. Um, can you close the, the poll? Sure. So his CT scan shows um, a small sub subdural, very small on the right side, maybe diffuse axonal injury. That's not a CT scan uh, uh, diagnosis, but there was something that they were worried about. Bilateral hemoneumothoraces, multiple ribs fractures, sternum fracture, a shearing fracture of the of pelvis, as we knew. L1 split fracture, L2 burst fracture. We have to be worried about the, the spine when the patient has fallen from a height. And then multiple left upper extremity fractures and bi bilateral calcaneal complex fracture, as is not that unusual with that kind of fall. So huge energy. Okay. So quite a few questions, and I'll just go through them before you put up the poll. Um, so the question for a team and for a dedicated trauma service is, uh, when do we declare that the patient is not bleeding anymore? Until when do we continue giving blood products? Do we start giving water now? The patient has a lot of potential bleeding sources. We do we want to dilute him, give him more coagulopathy? When do we um, uh, operate on him definitively? What kind of sequence do we, um, do we plan for this patient in, in the OR? When do we start with, uh, with Fragmin or Clexane or Tromophophylaxis? Uh, this guy definitely needs it. He's, in, 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 uh, he's at risk. Um, do you think his patient will need dialysis? When do we start feeding? What kind of antibiotics? Do we give him extended prophylaxis? Do we give him just short prophylaxis and, and wait for the in infection? Uh, and do we immunize? And when do we immunize these, this patient for splenectomy? I think you can pull up the poll. Yeah. And here is the poll. Again, you have 15 seconds. That's quite challenging because we have uh, more answer. <clears throat> and we'll just make a few comments on that because I think the rest is, is also for, so we, we're now running up to Marius's uh, talk. Come on, people. It seems that people is not voting here. Okay. Can I just make some comments then? Is that if we are yeah, sure. Make the comments if you can. Um, so, in my mind, and we'll, we'll take the discussion after afterwards, uh, after the, the talk of, of Marius Kiel. Uh, I think uh, continuing with blood until the patient is actually resuscitated back to normal physiology. So that means using plasma instead of using crystalloids. Even in ICU, after until the patient is 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 really uh, not he. If you saw his last blood gas, he had a, a, a lactate now a pH of seven point zero seven. He needs still to be to be resuscitated back to normal. He has a lactate of eighteen, and that needs blood products. Want his subdural to be worsen, and as well, we need his coagulation to be normal. Uh, definitive surgery. I would never go later than uh, than so as soon as the patient is is um, resuscitated with the packed pelvis. I would wait no more than forty eight hours. Uh, I would go back 
daytime with the best team and at least some of one of the surgeons who were there in the first time, ideally. And then the pelvis should be done first. The spine will have to be second. If the patient tolerates it, he can do it in, in one day. I think this patient had so much, such a bad, bad shock situation that we decided in this patient that the pelvis is taken first and then the patient gets a one day rest and then the, the spine. He's not going to be moved around anyway during that time. Thromboprophylaxis, I would start early, even before unpacking, first 24 hours, if the neurosurgeons allow me to because of, uh, with, with that head injury, I would do it even within the 24 hours. Dialysis, he will probably need it better early than late. Nutrition, as soon as, as long as he doesn't have bowel discontinuity, uh, he can start uh, early enteral. Antibiotics, only prophylaxis and immunization, uh, we would say normally within one or two weeks, but after, after the patient is out of the first, first rounds, but before he leaves um, ICU. So I will share the results. Just half people replied to our question. Do you want to say, do you want to uh, comment on them? I think they actually they actually uh, agree with what we what you just said. So that means according to physiology, so with the resuscitating the patient within forty eight hours, I definitely agree. Um, yeah, but then worried about uh, uh, not being able to do all of that surgery the first time you take the patient back, and he has to be reassessed during surgery. This is many many hours. Um, also, he will need to be on his, uh, his prone position to do his spinal surgery. Spine injury as soon as possible, I agree. Definitely. Trauma prophylaxis, I agree, but within 24 hours. The only head injury is the only thing that could delay uh, trauma prophylaxis. Dialysis. I think we have to, to realize that some of these patients need early or benefit from early dialysis, but um, I think that is, there is no consensus. Enteral nutrition, yes. I would give prophylaxis and wait for the infection. He will get infections. I think uh, we get a lot of, of uh, so resistant bacteria if we give too much of extended prophylaxis. He's not, he doesn't have an infection yet. Immunization, yes, as soon as possible. I think that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> and just to say the pelvic fixation was done after 36 hours on day two, and then the spinal fixation on day four. He got pneumonia as expected. He was extubated on day 19 after the last definitive extremity surgery. He was on continuous hemodialysis until day 14, and intermittent until the day 21. Got psychiatric follow-up, obviously, and going to early rehabilitation day 24. And he's well rehabilitated uh, since then, but with sequelae, obviously. And I think that concludes it. Great, Tina. Thank you very much. I think you 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 close the case. Fantastic. So uh, a very very tricky and demanding case. Uh, I would suggest to to maintain the, the the fluency of the of the meeting of the webinar to a, a, a very short comment from all the panelists who want to, to do that. Uh, I would start with the Marius, Marius, if you have to comment now. Oh, excellent case. Congratulations, especially with the emergency thoracotomy. Um, probably I have done immediately also a plate on the synthesis because on the way back during packing, you can fix it. And it makes it easier the management without the binder. Okay, thank you. Mike. That needs some experience of the orthopedic trauma surgeon. They are very experienced, but I think he got so much trouble during that first surgery that, that, that there was nothing, there was not an option to do anything unnecessary at that time. But you have more close the pelvis, it's more stable. The pelvic binder has always a risk for displacement, so the for instability. The pelvic binder was, was relieved uh, immediately when he was resuscitated back to normal. That, that, that means always been within 12 hours. And he's not going to be moved much before he goes back to surgery anyway. And so the, other, and the hmm? other option is to take a, a pelvic C-clamp because then you have also a, a very stable situation on the pel, a posterior pelvic ring. That's a problem with the pelvic binder. It's not so stable for the posterior pelvic ring. 
It doesn't need mobilization. So I, mean, I think our, our orthopedic uh, pelvic surgeons, uh, they are they are slightly on a different uh, way of thinking. And I think there is probably not a consensus around that. But I, but I think so. We have used this, the, the C-clamp, I think, once or twice over the last five years. And uh, we, we say that binder is fine, but it has to be relieved early. Never more than 12 hours. As soon as the patient is is uh, is resuscitated, doesn't bleed anymore. Doesn't need a binder, and he's not going to go anywhere. With even with, and especially with a non-operated spine, he's going to be in his on his back until he gets his surgery with good nursing. And he doesn't need more time. Pep, Pep do we have a comment? I think it was a very difficult case and very well managed by Oslo team. Uh, what was the, the injury to the spleen? Was it the grade four uh, splenic injury? No, this was a, this was a grade two, three. I mean, it's, it's just, but he was bleeding. So there was no reason in that situation to do anything else. This guy was dying on table. I understand. Well done. Andrea, I, I, don't know I can start with the presentation, otherwise I'm in delay a little bit. Okay, so I, I think that, uh, we can go ahead with your presentation and then we, we, we try to answer the question and answer from the attendees and the comment of the other uh, panelists. So we leave the, the stage to Professor Kier from Zurich. Do you see my presentation? Perfectly. Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> I cannot give a presentation to show you all the details but I want to give you some ideas what we have to respect and uh, to treat and to manage. Um, well, with our management, we have no influence on the primary injury on the spinal cord. It's clear. However, we should prevent any secondary injury because survival is something, but the uh, worse outcome is also with a bad function with spinal cord injury secondary. Uh, and I think that's also important to recognize. For me, in the management, very important is a suspicion of an injury, of a cervical spine injury, of thoracic or a lumbar spine injury. The question is, should we immobilize at scene and also at the early stage in the hospital, yes or no? And here the data are not very clear. However, we should always think about it, what can happen when we do locker roll and so on. The second point is to prevent secondary injury. We have to do a decompression as early as possible if there is any displacement. To ensure the treatment priorities in polytrauma patients, you have seen in this case, I think pelvis is more important because uh, of the bleeding. Bleeding is mostly not so the problem in spinal injury, um, and that's the reason why probably in this case it's more important to fix the pelvis and to prevent the late complications. So secondary pseudoarthrosis, for example, I will show you one a small case about it. There are quite good guidelines. I think they are now translated in English from the German polytrauma uh, guidelines, what we should do also at the beginning. However, in the literature, it's not clear should we really always immobilize the cervical spine. And there are uh, some studies, two studies, however, there is no high level evidence what to do with uh, immobilization or not uh, with cervical spine. I think everything what is more important is to treat it first as to do an immobilization and there are some uh, aspects, I don't want to go into details, but the Norwegian guidelines are quite good. And uh, there are some risk factors to have perhaps a cervical spine injury, consciousness disorder, neurological deficits if the patient is alert, pain, a pain in the spine, intoxication, extremity injuries, especially when the mechanism is a fall. However, it's not only rules for the cervical spine, it's also for the uh, thoracic and the lumbar spine. But at the end, the right diagnosis can be only done, not only by X-ray, especially by CT scan. Um, for me, important in patient they are alert is you have to ask if there is any neurological disorder and especially some radicular symptoms for a cervical spine, if they cannot move the fingers or the hand, there are a typical sign for any cervical injuries. So suspicion is done by clinical evaluation if the patient is alert.
However, at the end is the X-ray for cervical spine. And you see here, there are some small signs sometimes for an important or a, or a significant injury. And you must some have experience to read this X-ray. It's not always so easy. The CT scan is easier. And you have to check, for example, in cervical spine, not only the vertebral body, you have also to check the position of the facet joint, jumped facet joint, uh, dislocated facet joint. That, that was a, a scan of a young hockey player. And mostly, it's not only a bony lesion, and the AO spine has described some modifiers that are very important. For example, in cervical spine, to have a worse outcome, a special uh, critical disc herniation, which can make a central stenosis with a very bad outcome. And in this hockey player, you see here now uh, the injury through the facet joint and the central stenosis, and he had an incomplete tetraplegia, and then uh, immediately a uh, fixation should be done with uh, a disc uh, resection and you can do mostly it from the front and here after six months and he's playing again okay however cervical spine injuries are mostly especially in such cases as tina shown underestimated when you see here uh, you can say not where is really the injury and uh, when you see it after 10 days you see here a sliding between C4 and 5 and when you go in detail you see here there is some distended uh, facet joint there are typical sign you should address and to avoid secondary displacement with troubles in other case you can have this herniation with a central stenosis and spinal cord injury here after fixation um, when we should do acute decompression? Um, sure, at first the patient should be stable enough to go in a prone position. Um, however, in this case, with no other really injury, with an incomplete tetraplegia, and you see here a crazy displacement uh, without any internal fixation, you cannot save uh, really the spinal cord. However, it's very difficult to do a reduction without any secondary damage. And uh, it's a C-type injury. We have done a decompression from the backside immediately. Uh, however, you will have a very severe epidural bleeding. And sure, such a case is only possible to treat if it's stable enough. With other injuries, secondary, we have done a revision posteriorly because one screw was not perfect and then the fixation from the front and it's quite a good recovery we have observed. So for me, timing of decompression will be decided if there is a primary incomplete neurological deficit, if there is a complete uh, neurological deficit with a tetraplegia or paraplegia complete, then you have more time because recovery is mostly uh, bad. Um, however, we uh, should make a safe reduction maneuver and that's the reason to do a decompression we should prevent systemic complication however in the literature the time point of decompression is not clear for example in the states they are discussing about uh, 72 hours or more but in my opinion if there is any incomplete neurological deficit or uh, paraplegia you should be as early as possible if you can go with the patient in a prone position. That was such a case after a motorcycle accident, we have done CT scan and it's quite a rare case with a complete separation of two vertebral body. And this, this uh, lady has also some other troubles because with displacement you can uh, see it here, you have a compression of the trachea of the, uh, on the esophagus and so you have not only to prevent any secondary damage to the spinal cord, you have also to prevent damage to more important organs. So we have done immediately after CT scanning also of the, of the uh, head, after polytrauma CT scan and open reduction and fixation. It takes quite a lot of time, such a surgery, about five to six hours to have an absolutely anatomic reconstruction 
because you have to reduce the vertebral body beside the aorta. Here, after one year, we've complete recovery. And however, there are also other data why we should do also an early stabilization, not only decompression, you can reduce the intensive care time, you can reduce the hospital stay, um, you can reduce also other complications, especially respiratory complications, ventilatory days, because you can mobilize earlier the patient. Here, such a situation with an incomplete or such uh, only a L3 uh, symptomatic, and however, here you see quite uh, severe compression on the nerves. However, on this level, you will have not a paraplegia. yield. But it's better to do a decompression to do an early uh, fixation. However, on the uh, lumbar level, you have a high tolerance because of the cauda equina here after the anterior additional uh, fixation and spondylolisis. However, in C-type injuries, like in this, you will have neurological problem. It's a locked displacement. And in such a case, if you can go in prone position, you should uh, immediately do a reconstruction and reduction of the spine. Here after fixation, some, days, uh, some weeks later, we have reduced the fixation length, especially in paraplegic patients, you should have a very short stiffness of the lumbar spine for a good functional outcome. Uh, here, another case with a C-type complete uh, paraplegia. In such a case, you can do an, uh, a fixation and decompression after some days. However, this case was stable enough. You see it here also to fix the pelvis and to do the spinal procedure immediately. But in a case, as Tina has shown, you should wait uh, some days because the bleeding is quite severe and the recovery mostly is not perfect. Now, just to show you in cervical spine and cervicothoracic injuries, you should really think about injuries. That was an old lady with a missed odontoid injury, and that's about three months later with a severe stenosis of the spinal cord on the level C1 and the forearm magnum, and she had a repetitive uh, cerebral uh, uh, embolization with a very bad uh, a situation and you can imagine with such a stenosis you have quite a bad outcome and such injuries we have to fix early and not to wait too long otherwise you have to do a big surgery with complete decompression of foram magnum and c1 and to do an occipital cervical fixation with a functional bad outcome when you fix this autoantoid fracture early you can fix it only on one level with a very good function uh, here, after surgery, it's a 90-year-old lady with a missed odontoid fracture. Here, another case, a 53-year-old man after a, an accident during work. And the problem on the cervicothoracic level, X-ray is not an option. You need a CT scan because they missed an injury with a locked and displaced a facet joint with a very bad function and uh, position. And to do a late surgery of such an injury is very bad with a high risk. So you have to do an anterior osteotomy debridement, and posterior reduction on the neuromonitoring, and then again an anterior fixation. And that's quite a huge surgery. When you do it immediately, it's quite easy. And here it's the huge fixation and stabilization now in anatomic reduction. And here the CT scan after fixation two years after injury with a good outcome. However, when you uh, see this injury early, you can fix it on one level or two levels with a, with a better functional outcome. So just in summary, I wanted to show you, think about injuries, don't miss it because it's bad outcome and very complex surgery later on. Acute decompression should be done in incomplete paraplegia or tetraplegia. However, you need the patient stable enough to go in a prone position. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marius. I think that uh, all the participants uh, remain astonished uh, looking at the, 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 the deepest, um, the so deep uh, uh, overview of the of a very huge problem and thank you for 
helping us to prioritize uh, timing and uh, uh, different, uh, very, very difficult situation. Uh, so I would uh, restart to ask all the panelists to give comments on the case from the side and uh, if any, uh, to comment. Mauro, can you hear me? Yes. So I, have, I have a little question for Tina and a small comment on the case. Do we have time? Go ahead. Okay. Tina, congratulations. It was, that, was, that was a, such an interesting case. I have a small question for you. Maybe you told that before, but I didn't pick it up. Do you have an hybrid room or did you have to go from the OR to the angel suite? This is the question. And my comment is that probably, probably we would have put an external fixator on a C, or a C clamp at the very end of the index laparotomy. Yeah, so um, our, our pelvic surgeons are part of the trauma team as well. And uh, so we have a, a shared protocol based on their experience over the last 20 years. It's a little bit different uh, strategy than, than, than what you do. I know it's different in different parts of the world. Um, we do have a hybrid operating room uh, and it's tra trauma only uh, in, the oper in, in the emergency department. The, the, that is uh, the last five years. We got it in 2014 after a big struggle. Uh, because and, and when someone asks me what, how many patients I actually sh save by having that in the same room, maybe two or three patients a, a year make a huge difference. Before that, we had to go 300 meters to the angio suite to, to get the patient and to choose whether to go to the OR or the hybrid room. So we're very happy for those few patients. This was one of them. Okay. So Just to say goodbye, thank you. Huh? So you left the pelvic binder uh, until a uh, uh, definitive operation. Much. No, 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 no. We, we, we never leave the pelvic binder longer than until the patient stops bleeding and is resuscitated physiologically. Then we let the, let the, the, take the binder off in the ICU and we have very early fixation with the, with the orthopedic surgeon, never later than 48 hours, but the pelvic binder comes off after less than 12 hours mostly. We, we are not leaving on a pelvic binder for 48 hours. Never. Okay. Yeah, that, that is very... There is yeah. evidence that uh, pelvic packing doesn't increase the risk of infection after uh, internal fixation. I didn't get the last, uh, the last question, but last, last comment. Jacopo, could you repeat? The question was, is... Uh, no, if... so there, is, there is much concern about internal fixation after pelvic packing, but the recent evidence showed that there is no risk of, of increased infection rate after parking yeah so I, th I think this this guy he told us what he needed basically that patient was well, he was dying uh, he there was no way he could have had uh, he could have so had the, the bleeding stop without the packing he needed packing and angioembolization uh, he did not tolerate more surgery on that first take he stayed with his binder for 12 hours he get back to surgery after one and a half day uh, and yeah. he did not get an infection in his pelvis it was a closed closed wound I mean, open, pel open, open pelvic fractures, yes, but, but in that situation, we, we, we don't see that very often. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I would ask uh, Andrea Mingoli and uh, Massimo Cherugi if they want to comment or to uh, pose some questions. Andrea is not. I'd, I'd better leave room to the panelists. <laughs> okay. Or Andrea, to attendees, if, if there are some attendees who would like to raise a question. I don't know. Sure. At the moment, I am a little bit timid, so a few questions on the question and answer button. Maybe. Falco, would you like to comment? Yeah, can I, if I give uh, one comment, a very nice case presentation, Tina, thank you very much. And I think this uh, also in combination with the presentation of Marius Kiel highlights the need to be involved in, in the ICU, as you re uh, frequently say. Um, they have really rigid time frames of 12, 12 to 24, 24 to 48 hours, but it's not that rigid as you present it. It's determined by the patient and the patient's physiology when they declare themselves fit for surgery again and I think it's important to, to keep that as a key note of this, this lecture. Thank you Falco. 
Jonathan, as, vi as the Vice President, would you like to give some comments on the webinar and on the case? I think it's an excellent webinar and it was an excellent case, Tina. Uh, congratulations on that and the management. And when you think about it, the injury that was really life-threatening for that patient uh, it could have been far, far worse. Um, but essentially, he had a pelvis that was exsanguinating, which made all of his other injuries that much more significant. And it was that early decision, I think, to uh, open his chest to get control that allowed you then to fill him up and to uh, assess and treat the other injuries. Um, it was that very early decision, I think, that bought time to, uh, to, to sort out the rest of the patient. And if that hadn't been done, I think the outcome would have been very different. Sorry, Mauro. Uh, I see that among, among uh, the attendees, uh, uh, I see that there is also Klaus Wendt, who is uh, also very committed in spine surgery. And we, we might ask a comment to, to Klaus too. If Klaus can yes. hear us. Yes, thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay. We yeah, you. Very interesting case. Of course, there are different solutions in different countries. Uh, the first step with uh, no uh, IV access and intubating, yeah, this is for, for me, was it not really clear why, why this happened? Okay, I, I heard about it was, uh, was different to do uh, or difficult to do, but this is a very difficult situation if you start with intubating without an IV access. So in, uh, this is the first point. And the other is uh, we are... We should we the, the discussion about going to the CT scan or directly to the OR. It depends on where the CT scan is. If the CT scan is in the uh, in the in resuscitation room, but that depends on what is your infrastructure. And and we should you know for the rest it's a perfect uh, uh, yeah perfectly done. But we would you know we would leave the you know pelvic binder after the operation and then uh, we will you know, put on an external fixator. We, you know, the C-clamp we don't use anymore since several years, but we still use the external fixator uh, until we have the you know, definitive stabilization. Then we take some time, so for, it depends on the situation of the patient, then you can wait one, two, three or four days before uh, pelvic stabilization. So Tina, very, very good treatment of this polytrauma patient. And yeah, there are always some, some, yeah, some points where, where, where we can get in a different solutions. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I, I think that is uh, 10 past seven. Uh, quite in time and uh, if there are no uh, more questions uh, from the attendees uh, or someone who, who raised hand i think that uh, we could close uh, our our webinar uh, ayato if you want to add something or uh, uh, some things to to, to to say maybe one is that you will receive a, 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 a questionnaire on uh, uh, about your feelings when you close your connector. So I will ask you to answer in order to help us to improve uh, next uh, uh, next webinar. Okay. So so uh, we are working, uh, uh, as uh, some of you already know, we, we are working with uh, Estes, uh, trying to, um, to expand this new way of the communication. Uh, uh, it, it will not compensate the, the Oslo Congress, and uh, I just would remind all the attendees that uh, we will have our Oslo Congress next year, same day. So, Mark your calendar regarding this issue. And uh, if you are happy with it, please, uh, uh, if you're happy with the webinar, just uh, 
spread the voice when you receive an email or a WhatsApp. Uh, it's quite intuitive and feel free to forward uh, the message to, uh, to, to your friends and colleagues, uh, residents uh, and um, young surgeons. We need young surgeons. We need also, it's all, also open to medical students. Um, uh, some medical students are taking their decision regarding their future. So please feel free to spread and share the voice. Thank you for attending. Yeah. Massimo, would you like to tell something about, uh, or to say something about Circuit from the Yes, Secret? again, again, I, uh, I wish to thank everybody. I appreciated very much the presentation of Tina and the lecture of Dr. Kiel. Uh, as I said before, this should be the first step needed to keep in touch because uh, it's important to share experience, especially in an uh, ever-changing um, field like trauma and acute care surgery. So thank you to everybody again, and I hope to see you in the next web webinar, international webinar. Thank you, Massimo. I think that if I had to, I allow me, I, I would close. And from the uh, Italian point of view, so from the point of view, I can say that we will go ahead. Uh, we will probably come back to Italian because uh, as language, main language, because obviously uh, it's, it's more demanding to, to attend an international meeting. But anyway, we will go ahead and in the, in the next uh, uh, two weeks, in the next two weeks of, uh, of our first virtual um, congress uh, in Italy uh, and we will go ahead again with this format, educational format. So thank you very much to all and to all the guests uh, um, give us this opportunity to share knowledge and experiences. Thank you. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.